I'm privy to what Brother Domley is going to preach today. I do think that one, uh, and I'm not going to try to steal a sermon, I do think it is much needed. Uh, if I could take all the counseling I do in the back room with grown people, and I could find some place to head it off at the pass, it would be with this kind of sermon here today. So I want you to, how many have never heard Brother Domley preach? Would you raise your hand? You have never heard him preach? Oh, you're in, for a, you're in for a good time. How many have heard him preach before? Raise your hand. There you go. And uh, how many would agree that we're fixing to enjoy ourselves? Amen? Good. So what I want you to do is put your hard hat on, and here we go. Amen? This truly is hot preaching right here. Give Brother Domley a hand. Brother Domley, come preach for us. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. You can be seated. Thank you so much. You can be seated. Hey, have you noticed the, have you noticed the initials? Brotherhood of believers is what? Against the sisterhood of saints, which is SOS. They need help. Are you ready, guys? Sorry. But anyway, and um, I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much. Take your Bibles. Turn it for James chapter number one. James chapter number one. I'm going to jump right into the sermon. Can I get this thing out of the way? I feel like I am looking up to something here. Just lay it down or do something, whatever they say back there at the PA booth. There it is. Thank you so much. James chapter 1, we're going to start reading in verse 13. And before we stand, let me just say this. I'm about ready to preach a sermon. I need your undivided attention. I need your honesty. What I'm going to preach to this side of the crowd, it is desperately needed. To this side of the crowd, unbeknownst to most people today, it's affecting this side as well. And I just know that there's a battle that we fight in Christianity and it's only going to get worse. And I'm asking you in the next few minutes to be honest with yourself and to be honest with God. Because if the subject I preach on, if you don't get it right now, it will follow you the rest of your life. And your future truly, and trust me, when we get it, start getting into the subject, this is not an easy subject to admit. But if you don't take care of it now, your future will be decided in this sermon. Your marriage will be decided in this sermon. Your conscience will be decided in this sermon. Your confidence will be determined in this sermon. Your spirituality will be determined in this sermon by what you do Today, James chapter 1, once you've found it, let's all stand as you read the word of God. James chapter 1, verse 13. If you have it, say amen. amen. All right, the ladies have it. If you're a man and you have it, say amen. amen. If you're not wearing pantyhose, say amen. amen. Here we go. Bible says in verse 13, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted, notice, with evil. I want you to notice this next phrase. Neither tempteth he any man, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his what? Own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. I want to help you out. I hope you listen to me. I'm not going to tell you what I'm preaching about. You'll get it here in just a few minutes, but I want you to listen. I want you to listen like your life depends on it. God, this morning, you know I have really worked this thing over my heart and mind for several days now. I've struggled with my spirit. I want to be proper but you know more than anything else, I really want to help these young people. 
I pray if there's ever a time, Holy Spirit, you've ever prodded someone to be alert. I pray this was that service. If there's ever a time that you've prodded someone just to be honest and come clean, this is that service. God, would you help me to help these young people, please, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The Apostle James, in this, these passage scriptures that we've just read, the Apostle James is dealing with the subject of temptation. We all deal with temptation. Everybody does. Let me be very honest with everybody. We are all sinners saved by the grace of God. You all agree with me on that. If you're a sinner, would you raise your hand? Would you raise your hand if you're a sinner? Wow, this is a pretty bad crowd. Let me ask you something. If you've sinned in the past week, would you raise your hand? My hand's up. You know what that means? That means this sermon's for everybody. Because everybody deals with temptation. Now, there are several things that, that, that James points out to us, that God points out to us, it's just some statements, some thoughts that prepare us for the sermon to come, but several things that God is trying to bring to our attention. First of all, you gotta understand that God doesn't tempt or allow his children to be tempted with sin. I want you to understand something. God says right here in our text verse, he says, he says, um, he says, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. For some reason, we have this idea that, well, God's allowed the temptation to come my way, the temptation of sin. Get this now, God does not, uh, does not tempt or allow his children to be tempted with sin. What I mean by that statement is this, God never okays for the devil to put sin in our path, never. Which leads me to statement number two, temptation is our own fault. Come on now. Hey, nobody made you turn on that wrong television show. You say amen right now. This is the easy part to say amen. Nobody made you walk and go to that party but you. Nobody made you look at that wrong website on your smartphone. Come on now. Nobody made you lit, turn on the radio station and listen to Garth Brooks. Come on. Nobody made you turn on the radio station and listen to Justine Bieber. Come on. Nobody made you turn on the radio station to listen to Miley Cyrus. Nobody. Nobody made you watch Duck Dynasty. <laughs> Nobody made you watch NCIS. Nobody. Hey, you're the one. We're the ones that choose to turn that power button on. And I'm the one. Listen, every temptation that comes Alan Domley's way is because I have put myself in the path to be tempted. I said statement number one, God does not tempt or allow his children to be tempted to sin. Statement number two, temptation is our own fault. Tem uh, statement number three, temptation creates lust. Temptation creates lust. There is, there's a, a lust is a passionate desire that cannot be rightfully fulfilled. Notice what it says right here. He says, but every man is drawn away of his own lust and what? And enticed. It's amazing when I put myself, listen, that's why some of you teenagers need to stop fighting mom and dad's rules. And that's why you need to stop fighting your preacher's rules. And that's why you need to stop fighting the youth pastor's rules. Why? We have those rules where we set up those rules to keep you you from temptation. We don't all get around with each other, put our arms around and say, hey, how can we make the teenagers tell I'm just miserable inside of life? We don't do that. What we do is we found out throughout the through experience, these things lead young people down the wrong path. It exposes them to temptation and we're trying to keep you from the temptation that we've watched others have to fight because once you're tempted, a lust inside of you that will in Entice you, hey, it comes inside and now you've got to fight it the rest of your life. Right down the road here, I live not far from the house or from the church here. When you're driving um, on the way to my house, we pass by, there's a, when I moved to Longview, Texas, preacher, I did not like cupcakes. Hated cupcakes. My wife came home one day, there's a cupcake shop just right around the corner from our house. She came home one day with four cupcakes and the frosting was piled 
this high on the top. It was called grasshopper mint. Um, it was a grasshopper mint cupcake. Brother, your tongue will slap you silly trying to get to that thing. She says, honey, do you want this? I looked at it. I like frosting. I looked at it and I thought, you know, what's one bite going to do, you know? I ate one bite of that cupcake. I hate that shop because every time I drive by that shop, I'm looking, is that thing open? For a while, they stopped selling the grasshopper mint, thank God, because let me tell you something, you can gain a lot of weight just driving by the shop. Amen. What happened? I, my wife, of course, she's not here, but anyway, my wife, she exposed me to something that I, of that cupcake. It created an enticement. Let me tell you something. When you're exposed to the wrong thing, it creates a lust inside of you, something you cannot rightfully fulfill. It creates an enticement, which leads to the statement number four. Lust leads to wrong plans. Listen, let me tell you what we as God's people do. We plan our sins. We come up with a plan that we feel like is fail safe that will never get caught. Nobody ever says, you know what, I want to commit sin. I hope my mom and dad catch me. We all, everybody, does, hey, we don't say, boy, I hope my preacher catches me listening to this music. Amen. We are so wicked. We are so corrupt. We conceive a plan. Notice what it says in, in, this, in the verses we just read. He says, they when lust hath what? Conceived. We literally conceive a plan. We born a plan. We put a plan together how we can commit the sin, and when we feel like it is fail safe, listen, then we eventually commit that sin, which leads to statement number sin, uh, six or five. Sin is the eventual actions of lust, which leads me to statement number six. Death comes from sin. Now listen to me. If I want to avoid the death, then I need to avoid the sin. And if I want to avoid the sin, then I need to avoid conceiving a plan. If I want to avoid conceiving a plan, then I need to avoid lust. And if I want to avoid lust, then I need to avoid be putting myself in a situation, get this now, that would expose me to something that would tempt me the rest of my life. Now listen carefully. Pornography is a temptation. Now we're going to come down where we all have to live. Pornography is not a modern day problem. It is a human being problem. You see, we've got to understand that even in the scriptures, God shows us there is pornography in the scriptures. You think of the story. I think of the story of Ahasuerus and Vashti. Remember the, that story in the book of Esther. Um, Ahasuerus had a drunken party and he said in a bunch of men are there and then when they got so drunk that he said, hey, why don't you call my wife? Call the queen, have her come dance before the men. Let me tell you something. She was not coming dressed decently. He wanted her to come and she said, thank God for Vashti. She says, I'll have no part of this wicked lifestyle. That was a, that was a story of pornography of those most men watching something that they should not have watched. David committed this horrible sin. You remember the time, Bible says he was up on his roof and the Bible says that he saw a woman dressed indecently. Hey, I do not believe that David's sin was a, he saw her and said, hey, bring her here. I believe, I cannot prove it, this little bit of domleology here. I believe he saw her. I think he went back inside of his, his castle. I think that night he began to dwell on him, began to think about it. He went back the next day and said, I wonder if she's still there. Looked again, said okay, he went back into his palace, began to think about it again, went back out in the roof. He, when he conceived the plan, then Bathsheba was brought to him. We know the rest of the story. He committed the sin and death came, a child died, his kingdom was marred. Why? It all started with that lust inside when he saw something and he, that he should not have seen and that image ate up his life, the remainder of his life. 
the Proverbs 7 young man was a young man who saw something wrong and it literally led to his death. He said, but Brother Domley, it's just a picture. I haven't, cre I haven't committed the wrong act of adultery or fornication. Follow me what God says. God says in Matthew chapter five, ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit what? Adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Very interesting, get this now, God's talking about a man looking on a woman dressed indecently, but he says that he's committed adultery, notice, with her. That means it takes a male and female for this sin to come about. You see, I know the statistics. And all the statistics say that 75% of this side of the crowd has seen a woman dressed indecently in the past 30 days. Some of you are looking wide-eyed right now. You're getting scared. I know the statistics. This will shock you. 45% of this crowd has dabbled in it. Getting quiet now, Brother Gray. He said, but those, those statistics are just for the, that's for the lost crowd. That's not really the safe crowd. Come on now. Let's stop trying to paint a pretty picture. Statistics are true. I promise you, there's a lot of you young men right now. You've come to this conference. You've had a reprieve from it for a while. But the truth is, you, you, you have looked at something wrong. You have seen, seen something you have not seen. I know there's young ladies on this side. You've looked at wrong pictures. And sadly, you say indecent pictures on your cell phone to see someone else, I'm saying somewhere, hey, right here at this teen convention, let's just decide, clean up this sin, let's decide to get this out of us tonight, let's decide to live a holy life tonight. You listen to me. I, I, I'm constantly hearing about pulpits coming open and churches closing down. How are we going to fill the pulpits in the future if the young men's minds are corrupted by pornography and the young ladies, they've allowed themselves to get caught up into this world. We need holy men of God to stand behind the pulpit of God with their conscience pure and clean. We need young ladies that decide, hey, I'm going to support a man by keeping myself clean. There are several dangers in pornography. I just want to tell you about, and then we're going to get into the very part of the sermon I'm preaching this whole thing for. Pornography, you'll find out in the book of Proverbs, is very addictive. Too many people think that, well, when I get married, I'll quit it because I'll be married. Let me tell you about a conversation I had with a man whose life ministry was ruined this past week. He said, Brother Domley, use my testimony. I'll not give you his name. He said, I saw my first picture when I was 12 years of age. He said, I thought when I got married, it would stop. He said, it didn't. It got worse. He said, what I thought marriage would stop. He says, marriage did not stop. You know why? It's addictive. He told me, he said, Brother Domley, I've been dry for three years. That's the words he used, Brother Gray. I've been dry for three years. He said, I know it sounds like I'm an alcoholic. He says, I'm not. But he says, I got hooked up in the world of pornography. He says, for three years, he says, I've been dry. 
for three years. And I'll tell you at the end of the sermon what all he's had to do to make sure he's been dry for three years. And I'm telling you right now, some of you say, well, I can handle it. You can't handle it. Because listen, some of you guys, these young ladies come walk through here pure and clean and you can't even look at them with having, without having impure thoughts inside of the your mind. I'm saying, hey, it is an addictive sin. Number two is deceptive. It promises you something that it can never give you. That's why they're a billion dollar business. Because they keep you coming back. You say, well, I, everyone look at me, I'm not preaching up there. I see some young men just staring off of the way, your head cocked, looking over here. I want you to look at me. Because you're telling me by doing that, you've already, I'm, I'm nailing you right now, and you know I am. And it's not me, it's the Holy Spirit of God. Listen, it's a very deceptive sin. It promises you satisfaction, but it only gives you dissatisfaction. That's why when you, you've given it up a hundred times, but you keep on going back. Why? Because it never satisfies. It says, hey, you just look at me one more time and, you, and, and I'll, I'll satisfy your needs. It cannot satisfy your needs because the only thing that can satisfy your needs is, something, is, is obeying God inside the bounds of marriage. Nothing, everything outside is wrong. Third thought, it desensitizes you. I have on my finger, my writing finger, a callus right here. I can dig my fingernail into that callus and I cannot feel it because it's been desensitized by writing all these years. I'm afraid too many of you young people have been desensitized to the pornography in our society. So what are you talking about? I'm talking about Abercrombie and Fitch stores. Come on, somebody can say amen and help me out, some of you adults. I'm talking about Blue Navy stores. I'm talking about you can't even walk into the stores without them having plastered the nudity and the pornography on the walls. And I'm saying it's about time we stop walking inside those places. You sit there and you watch Victoria's Secret on primetime television. Let me tell you, Victoria has no secret and you have no business watching that. You've been so desensitized by the sin that it doesn't even bother you when you see a commercial. It doesn't bother you when you see a naked body on NCIS, CSI. Well, now we're meddling, aren't we? You say, oh, that's a science, that's a science on television show. No, it's a pornography show. Boy, this is good preaching. You hear the preacher preach against us all the time. You know the Bible says that anything from the kneecap to the neck is nakedness, yet we watch it on television all the time and it never bothers us. And we say, well, I'm not addicted to it. Then why are you looking at the body? Why are some of you girls so caught up in the hip-hugging, tight-fitting clothes that show every form of your body? Why? You have been desensitized by this world. It doesn't bother you anymore. It doesn't bother you to see a woman walking around in a bikini. Because our society says it's normal, the word of God says it's pornography. It cripples your emotions. 
Young ladies, listen to me. A young man that's involved in this and looks at you as an object. Some of you young men, and I'm not, I'm not trying to preach downtown, I'm not trying to make you mad, I'm trying to help you right now. This is the time to get it taken care of. Because some of you, your mind has gone from looking at a creation over here that is pure and holy and clean to where all you think about is I wonder. I wonder how many thoughts have gone through your mind since you've been here at a Christian conference. It distorts your view. You see, it comes to the point that we've got to understand pornography is truly, get this now, such a corruptive sin. That once you get started in it, it's a hard thing to pull yourself away. Let me show you what God says. Take your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. I want you to look at verses 7, verse 7 right here, Romans chapter 7 and verse 7. He says, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. He says, but sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of Oh, what's the next word? Concupiscence. Say it with me. Concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. Get this now. That big word right there, concupiscence, let me tell you what that word means. It means an irregular desire for immoral pleasure. It's a, it's a heightened lust. In other words, get, get this now. God is dealing in Romans chapter 7, and don't miss this now. Often we use Romans chapter 7 as, well, this is the battle that the flesh fights. It is, but it goes deeper than that. When you look at the context of this verse, you realize that God is dealing with the very subject of pornography and what it does to a person. Notice what he says. He says, for when, he says, for I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I have found to be in the death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me. And by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, worketh death in me. By that which is good. That sin, by the commandment, might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Notice verse 15. For that which I do... I allow not, for what I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that do I. Notice, we're talking about what lust causes a person to do. You don't want to look at it, but you end up looking at it. You say, I'm not going to do it, but you're going to do it. You say, I'm going to do this, but you don't do this. You say, I'm going to get rid of it, but you go ahead and go back to it. That's exactly what he's talking about. He says, this is exactly what lust and pornography does to you. It causes you to always do what you know you should not do. He says, then I do that which I would not. I consent unto the law that is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my, what? Flesh dwelleth no good thing. You've got to understand, listen to me, this body is corrupt. And he says right here, he says, for the good that I would, I do, verse 19, but for the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find in the law that when I would do good, evil is present with me, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law, my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Notice this is the next phrase. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? 
Follow me very carefully. If you can go ahead and bring it up. Preacher, why don't you come here? And I need a good sized young man. I need someone pretty tall. Tall guy? Okay, right here. Come on over here. When Paul said, he said, oh, wretched man that I am. Hurry up, hurry up. The Lord's going to come. He was, go ahead and just tape him to him. Ha face to face, hand to hand, arm to arm, just tape him right to this thing. The apostle Paul while they're getting this ready, I want you to listen carefully. The Apostle Paul says, O wretched man, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? When he's talking about that, he is talking about a Roman, get this now, a Roman sentencing that is very well known. That many times the way they would sentence someone to death and the way they would do it is they would take a dead corpse. This is the dead corpse right here. And they would chain the dead corpse to that criminal hand to hand, face to face, feet to feet, body to body, that, that dead corpse is chained to the criminal. How you doing so far? Get this now. We got him in there? You probably have to tape the body up to him as well. That's good. Just get the body and then we'll get right into the remainder of the sermon. Now listen very carefully. Look at me. Look at me. God says, Paul said, he says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? This is a young man right here. What's your name? Quattro. Quattro? Yes, sir. Four. Okay, we're naming four. Quattro here, get this now, has been condemned to die. This body of death is on him. That should be good right there, I think. Got it? There it is. Everywhere he goes, just start walking around. Everywhere he goes, he, yeah, there you go. You got to carry that weight of that dead body. Let me tell you how bad a dead body is. Years ago, I used to work for the coroner. My job was to go pick up dead bodies. My first call, first one, a man had been dead for three weeks. 80 degree weather, the house was shut up. They didn't tell me, breathe through your mouth. I walked inside the house and oh, the stench of this body. Follow me carefully though, that's not all. The body had begun to bloat up like what Quattro is carrying right there. It began to bloat up. And I went to go pick up the body the man who was working with me said, he said, now, Mr. Domley, he said, let me warn you, because his body has already started to deteriorate. Be careful when you pick it up. He says, because when you pick it up, he said, you're not careful. The skin will pop. And this white man that had died had, had turned literally a black color. The defiling says that, that, that Jews, if you're not, not careful, when you pick up that body, you grab, he said, when you grab it, he said, skin will pop and all the juice will get on you. He says, you've got to be careful. Get this now. You've got to be careful that when you pick up that body, he says, the skin will literally slide off the body because it's so defiled. Paul equated pornography with a dead body. Get this. After I dropped the body off at the coroner's place for three days, I could not get the smell out of my nose. 
I could not smell a rose. I could not smell my food. I couldn't smell anything but the dead body. It literally took all enjoyment of life away. And Paul says when someone gets caught up in the sin of pornography, just like that criminal has been chained to that dead corpse, he says you get to the point where you're chained to that dead corpse and you hate the smell, don't you? Man, it's awkward. Get this now. Every time he tries to go to bed, he tries to sleep at night, go ahead. Try to get down. Try to go to sleep if you can. Yeah, that body is right there. He smells it all night long. He gets up. Can you get up right here? Need some help right now? He gets up in the morning. Don't, don't kill yourself. He gets up in the morning. He tries to eat food. Every time he tries to put food in his mouth, he's looking that dead body right there. No matter what he does, that smell is there. That stench is there. You listen to me. I'm talking to young people right now this morning. This is exactly how you feel right now about the sin of pornography. It's not that you're saying, boy, I want to do it, but you feel like it is chained to you. You feel helpless. You feel like, I don't know if I can get away. You've kept it private. You've not told anybody. No one knows about it. But if we went to the cache of your phone, we could find some bad pictures. If we went to your friends, we could find the magazines. We know, hey, the truth is, you know who you are. Get this. It leaves you feeling dirty. Young men in the back, don't be playing. This is not a funny time. I don't know what we're playing about right now. Listen, it's no wonder teenagers, Brother Gray, want to pierce their body. It's no wonder you want to tattoo your body all up. It's no wonder you want to plug your ears with those big plugs and make yourself look like a fool. It's no wonder that you want to hang yourself by skin, take, take hooks and hang yourself by skin. No wonder. It's no wonder you take knife and we looked at some of your wrists right now. There'll be scars on your wrist. Be no wonder that some of you have contemplated suicide because all you can smell is the stench of the corruption of the pornography that is eating your mind up, eating your body up, eating your life up. It is truly a weight and a corruption to your whole life. You'll notice the hopelessness that Paul said. He said, oh, wretched man that I am. Start walking. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And you know what's happened? You've come to the youth conference this week, and you've tried to, try to kneel down at that chair if you can. You've come to the youth conference this week. Can you kneel down? Maybe just sit down or do, it, do the best you can. You come to the youth conference this week. And for a little bit of time, you felt the spray, the perfume of the word of God preached. And it's kind of camouflaged this corpse. And you almost feel like maybe when I go home, it'll all be gone. Problem is you've not dealt with it. Because when you're gone from the conference, let's get up. Here you go, if you need my, you got it? When you're gone from the conference, you're going to go back to the same smell, the same corpse, the same defilement. You see, eventually, get this now, this corpse, the juices of this corpse will eventually kill him. Because the disease that's inside of this body will rot you to death. Paul said, 
Oh, wretched man that I am. Who? Who? Shall deliver me from the body of this death? He says, man, he says, I feel like I'm dying. I feel like my life is going. I'm, I'm, I see my future. I see it. It's dark because I carry this everywhere. I can't seem to get rid of it. Who shall deliver me? But the answer came. I thank God through Jesus Christ. <laughs> Boy, I'm glad that Jesus Christ didn't throw us away. And let me tell you, some of you right now, you listen to me. Some of you feel like God doesn't love you. God loves you enough, but somewhere, some of you are gonna have to come clean today and go to God today and say, God, I am tired of this. I'm tired of carrying this corpse around. I'm tired of this eating me up. I'm tired of this destroying my life. I'm tired of it taking care of my conscience. I'm tired of it. So how do I do that? First John 1 9 says, if we confess our sins, come here, God. If we confess our sins, He, God, is faithful and just to forgive us and what? Cleanse us. Very interesting. You go to God. Tell God your problem. Go ahead. What's your problem? Pornography. Yeah. As soon as he confesses it to God, honest with God, transparent with God, God begins to remove the corpse from your body. There is hope. There is a future. There is honest hope in Jesus Christ. The hope's not in Helen Domley. The hope's not in Pastor Gray. The hope's not in man. The hope is in Jesus Christ. Hey, that's the hope today. Some of you right now, you sit there and say, boy, I wish, I wish somehow I could get this body off of me. You can. You come down to an altar this morning and say, Jesus Christ, I have a problem. But then God also says he cleanses us. Get this. God doesn't just take the body from you. But he'll also clean you, clean him with the word of God. <laughs> God says, I will clean, I will take the stench, the smell. I will take it from you in a way that stench will no longer stick to you. But you have to be honest. Thank you. You can be seated. Let me give you several thoughts. I'm done. One, admit your weakness. Just get the CD. Don't worry about writing down. Just look at me right now. I don't want anything to take your attention away. And I don't want anybody moving because right now this is where the devil is going to start working. It's not easy to admit I have a pornography problem. What's my preacher going to think? What are my parents going to say? What is everyone around me going to do when they hear? Are they going to think I'm a pervert? I'm talking to youth pastors. Talking to men. I'm talking to adults. I'm talking to ladies. I'm talking to men. Admit it. Admit it. Second, confess your sin to God. 
come to this altar this morning. Say, God, I got a problem. Third, read and memorize massive amounts of scripture. The only thing, the water of the words, the only thing that's going to clean you up. You are going to literally turn off the television. Get in the word of God. And I mean memorize chapter after chapter. You see, but it has nothing to do. I don't care. It's like a bar of soap. It still cleans you up. Fourth, keep your time filled with activity and serving God. I mean, you're going to have to literally now purposely not have any vacant time. Fifth, remove any source of temptation. Listen, do you have your cell phone on you? Here's your cell phone. Bring it here. Here we got it. Some of you are going to have to go home. Listen to me. Go to mom and dad and say, I have a problem. I need you to have this because I can't trust myself. So you serious? How serious are you to get rid of this corpse? You see, it's too accessible right here. Because you know how to do it without anybody catching you. You've grown up with technology. Mom and dad think that you're, you're, you're innocent. Yeah, you know. Let me tell you something, and it's not easy going to mom and dad. It's like a lump in that throat. To mom and dad, I'm going to break your heart. I've got a pornography problem. I can't have that. I want to be honest with you, teenager. I don't know how your parents are going to respond. I wish I could say your parents would be broken hearted. Say, let me, let, let's work with it together. I hope that's what they do, but I don't know. They may explode. I don't know, but it's, but you have to understand if you're serious enough about it. You're going to have to get rid of anything that tempts you. We'll give this to you later on. Number six, be accountable to somebody. You will not do it by yourself. You will, listen to me, you will not do it by yourself. I talked, to, I talked to this gentleman. He was in the ministry, in a well-known ministry, on a church staff. Got caught in pornography. He, was, he, said, my, he said, Brother Donald, my first time I saw a wrong picture was when I was 12 years of age. He said, for years, for 20-something years, I was involved in it. He said, I got caught. He says, it ruined one marriage. Almost ruined my second marriage until I came clean. He says, today, listen to me, today this is what I have to do. He says, we have no television in our house. He says, every place I go, I've got to take a picture of where I'm at and text it to my wife. He said, if she calls, it don't matter what I'm dealing with, I better answer the phone. He says, because I have to be accountable to my wife. You say, that's some pretty drastic measures. How bad do you want to get rid of this dead body? We're about ready to come down to the part of this service that's going to be the toughest part, Brother Gray, of the whole service. Because I know there's young ladies over here who are, who are just as involved in it as these young men are. People say, young ladies, yeah. 
If you've taken an indecent picture of yourself and sent it to a young man, you're involved. I'm talking to young men right now. Boy, I could use some help. You've come to the right place. You've heard the right sermon. What are you going to do? Some of you this morning truly need to commit to God. I want to set up some guidelines. So I'm never exposed to the sin. Because all it takes is one wrong picture. And that body jumps on you. Father, this morning.